As the Vatican plans to respond to the global abuse crisis, what can be done? Former head of the Vatican Supreme Court, Cardinal Raymond Burke, is here to respond. And later, President Trump has signed a bill providing aid to persecuted Christians in the Middle East directly. Author of the legislation, Congressman Chris Smith, will tell us all about it. And finally, why was St. Paul so well suited to guide the formation of the early church? Attorney columnist and author David Limbaugh is here to tell us about his new book, Jesus is Risen, Paul and the Early Church, the World Over. Begins right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. Cardinal Raymond Burke, Congressman Chris Smith, and David Limbaugh are all straight ahead. If you'd like to comment, send me a tweet. I'll be live tweeting throughout. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. Where else? Here's some news from the world over. A gunman killed at least four people Tuesday and then took his own life inside a cathedral in southern Brazil. According to reports, the 49-year-old shooter entered Our Lady of the Conception Cathedral in Campinas at the conclusion of midday mass with two handguns and began firing. After being wounded in the shootout with police, he then shot himself in the head. Father Amaury Tomasi, who celebrated the midday mass, said that after the assailant came into the cathedral, nobody could do anything. He asked for prayers for the attacker and the victims. Police have yet to find a motive. And this past week, Bridgeport Bishop Frank Gaggiano appointed a layperson to lead one of the diocese's parishes after the death of its priest and pastor. Dr. Eleanor Sowers has been tapped to lead St. Anthony of Padua Parish in Fairfield. In announcing his decision, the bishop touted a new leadership model. Caggiano was one of six U.S. bishop delegates at the Synod for Youth. The Synod concluded that women's leadership within the church is a duty of justice. As for Dr. Sowers, she is a self-described feminist and modernist. For her doctoral thesis, she said of the parish that she now leads that the faith life there was childlike, simple, authoritarian, didactic, rigid, harsh, and, quote, out of step with the times and with the greater church, end quote. She went on to say that she hopes that feminist sensibilities can be integrated into the Catholic tradition. Joining us now is the former head of the Vatican's highest court, the Apostolic Signatura, and one of the world's foremost canon lawyers. He is also one of the four cardinals who posed the dubia questions to Pope Francis concerning Amoris Laetitia. Joining us now with his thoughts on all these stories and more is Cardinal Raymond Burke. He joins us from the shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Your Eminence, thank you for being here. Oh, thank you, Raymond. I'm pleased to speak with you. Uh, I want to talk about uh, this case of synodality. Uh, this is a term that popped up during, at the conclusion of the Youth Synod, um, and it was never brought up during the Synod. You had a kind of strong reaction to this term synodality, and uh, the young people didn't discuss it. It was kind of introduced at the last minute. What do you make of this? Is this the way we should govern the church and make decisions in the church? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, synodality has a very distinct meaning in the Roman Catholic Church, distinct from its meaning in, for instance, uh, the Orthodox churches. And uh, synodality in the, in the Roman Catholic Church uh, is an institution to assist the pastors of the church in teaching more effectively church doctrine and in applying more effectively church discipline. It has nothing to do with creating uh, doctrine or changing doctrine or creating discipline and changing it. it, it it's a, it's a, an important function to assist the, those who have the pastoral care of the church. And so mm -hmm. in, the, in the Roman Catholic Church, we have diocesan synods, we have uh, provincial synods, and uh, you can even have a national synod, but they mm -hmm. all have that same scope. Yeah. Uh, synodality in the Orthodox churches uh, involves actual governance. And, of course, as you know, the 
the Orthodox churches are, are not one throughout the world mm -hmm. as the Catholic Church is. We have uh, a unity which is guaranteed uh, by the uh, office of Peter, the, the Petrine mm -hmm. office. And so this is, uh, uh, to introduce this term into Catholic uh, thinking without defining carefully its meaning is very dangerous. Mm. Do you and, think it uh, threatens I, uh, papal I, authority? Absolutely it does, and it also threatens the unity of the church. I mean, mm. With this kind of notion, we could well end up with national churches, we could well end up with uh, a whole variety of divisions within the Catholic Church. Mm. Speaking of divisions, uh, I want you to comment briefly on Archbishop uh, Carlo Maria Vigano's uh, testaments, multiple testaments. He talks about members of the Curia, even the Pope himself, having knowledge of Cardinal McCarrick's doings and goings on long before he was promoted up the hierarchical chain. Your reaction to the virtual silence from Rome on all of this? We've seen a few letters from uh, one congregation head, but very little uh, in the way of answering the charges or exposing uh, what may or may not have happened here. They supposedly are uh, opening up the documents and looking for documents, but I've heard no findings. Well, I trust that there is a serious and uh, objective investigation taking place uh, because these accusations are of the most serious kind and are rightly the cause of a, uh, a, a, a grievous scandal in our nation and, and, and as a result, uh, a crisis which I uh, witness uh, every time I've visited our nation uh, mm -hmm. since this, uh, uh, the revelations about Theodore McCarrick, mm -hmm. and I am uh, deeply concerned that uh, the church, for the sake of her own credibility, and more importantly, for the sake of her care of souls, gets to the bottom of, mm -hmm. uh, of these accusations and appropriate discipline is applied uh, to those who are, are the cause of such a scandal. Hmm. Uh, looking ahead to this summit on abuse that is scheduled to convene for three days in February, give me your thoughts. There's been a lot of um, uh, political uh, capital expended on this. The Pope silencing the American bishops in their attempts to uh, enact some protocols to deal with this crisis. The Pope said, no, we're having a global meeting in February. What do you believe needs to come out of that meeting and is protocol for dealing with bishops, bishops who are charged of this abuse, necessary? We have in the Code of Canon Law, we've had it in the Church's discipline for centuries, the, the correct process to use to investigate such accusations. That needs to be applied. And calling meetings and developing new documents and so forth mm -hmm. is not going to answer the question. Mm. The question which has to be answered is uh, what actually happened and who is responsible for it. Mm. And the church has the processes in place to do that. And uh, what, the, what can happen with the presidents of the conferences of bishops coming together for three days, I don't know. But we don't need any more new documents, that's for sure. Mm. What uh, is that we, process, briefly, uh, uh, Your this, Eminence? This, people are not aware of, of the, the, uh, the canon law that already speaks to this issue, but that involves the Holy Father himself disciplining these bishops, yes? Well, the only person who can discipline a bishop is the, is the Pope, the, 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 the authority in the church who appointed him and who has the direct uh, authority over bishops. The bishops' conference can uh, have various programs in place to, to uh, regarding these issues, but it's the Pope himself who has to investigate first mm -hmm. to see if the accusations are credible, and seemingly they are. Then he has to institute a canonical process mm -hmm. uh, to uh, get to the truth of the matter. Now, if the person who is accused simply says, yes, I did these things, mm -hmm. uh, then the process doesn't have to go forward, then you apply the appropriate discipline. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, there's a canonical trial, uh, and uh, that trial uh, is conducted in a way to get at the objective truth, and it comes to a decision, and on the basis of that decision, the appropriate uh, 
a sanction is, is imposed in order to, uh, to repair the damage done to the church and also to give the, the guilty party the possibility of, of, uh, of an amendment of his life and uh, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. for a grave harm done. Uh, Cardinal Burke, is lay involvement needed at this point? Given the, the, the breakdown in credibility, certainly on the American scene and in parts of Europe, the, the, the laity simply don't trust that the bishops can police themselves or even that Rome is going to be fully engaged on this. Is there a role for the laity in the process of investigation? The first point to be made is that the, the church authority involved is not free to do what it pleases. It has to follow the norm of the church's discipline. That's known by all. It's the objective order in the church, and that's what preserves uh, faith in the church, the laity's faith in, in their shepherds. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, there can be appropriate involvement of laity who are ex experts, for instance, with regard to uh, in, in certain aspects of the investigation which has mm -hmm. to be uh, undertaken, uh, ex experts in certain aspects of the proofs that have to be gathered by the tribunal, which mm -hmm. is which is studying the matter, and that's very appropriate and, uh, and, and correct. Mm. But the, the judgment has to come, the final judgment has to come from the, the authority of the church as it's established in the church's discipline. Yeah, so and it's to, ultimately... To try to... Uh, yeah, so ultimately the responsibility falls to the pope to deal with these, these uh, bishops who correct. are accused. Well, uh, no, that, exactly, that's, uh, that's clear. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and to pretend otherwise, it simply leaves everything uh, in confusion and mm -hmm. uh, uh, in uncertainty. Mm -hmm. I, I want to move on to the focus of this meeting, Your Eminence. This February meeting is being billed as a, a, a summit to address the abuse of minors. But so much of this sexual abuse scandal, certainly in this wave of it, in the United States, in Germany, uh, in South and Central America, it's targeted adolescent boys and seminarians, young men. Are they missing the framing on this yes. question? Well, I think the the point is uh, is is the abuse uh, of those who rightly put trust in their shepherds in the church and their pastors only to to have the pastor abuse or attempt to abuse them. That's uh, clearly uh, grievously wrong, a grievous sin. Mm -hmm. Now, secondly, you, as you say, the majority of these acts are, are homosexual acts committed either with, with young, with adolescents or with seminarians, young men. And the, I would say that the question that has to be addressed is, uh, the question of, 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 of a homosexual culture mm -hmm. uh, in the clergy uh, that uh, leads to this kind of, of conduct. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying, and I've been accused of saying, that all people who have same-sex attraction prey on, on children and adolescents. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying simply th the fact is that most of these acts are homosexual acts, and therefore, clearly, there is a difficulty mm -hmm. in the seminary formation and the discipline of priests mm -hmm. with regard to homosexual conduct. I want you to react to some comments by the Pope in a recent book-length interview that he granted where he spoke to just this, and he said, the issue of homosexuality is a very serious issue that must be adequately discerned from the beginning with candidates. Uh, if that is the case, we have to be exacting. In our societies, it even seems that homosexuality is fashionable, and that mentality in some way also influences the life of the church. Uh, your reaction to that, Cardinal Burke? Well, it, it, it seems to me to be, uh, to be quite correct uh, that, and this was always the case, I entered the minor seminary in 1962, and there was great attention to, the, uh, to, to sexual morality in an appropriate way. Uh, so that uh, young men would not uh, uh, give way to any kind of, of, of wrong attractions or, or wrong tendencies. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's true that today there is a, a tremendous power of the, what is called the homosexual agenda 
uh, in society, and this obviously will have effect on the young people of today, also the young people being called to the priesthood. Mm. And so there has to be uh, th the same attention and perhaps even greater attention to try to assist any, all young men who come into the seminary to make sure that they're, they do not have disordered attractions. If they do have disordered attractions of what, what is the nature uh, mm -hmm. of that attraction, and if it's a deep-seated attraction, uh, then of course the person is not uh, is not a candidate to, for mm -hmm. for ordination to the priesthood. So this is an interview. It's it's not stated in in what in a kind of uh, a logical document. way. But if I understand right, if, but if I'm if I'm under, if I'm understanding it correctly, I would agree with it. Yeah, uh, he goes on to say this, and this is Pope Francis in this book-length interview. He says, we have to urge homosexual priests and men and women religious to live celibacy with integrity, trying to never scandalize either their communities or the faithful holy people of God by living a double life. It's better for them to leave the ministry or the consecrated life rather than to live a double life. Is this recognition that there are people living in this state, and what can be done about it? Well, it seems to me that, yes, the Holy Father is acknowledging that there, there are priests, there are religious who uh, suffer from same-sex attraction, and even there are those who are, who are acting upon these attractions in a sinful way. Uh, certainly, if, if there is a priest or, or, or a religious who is suffering in this way, and uh, they have to... Uh, Return to the discipline of perfect continence. This is the whole meaning of, of, of the vow of chastity. This is the whole meaning of the promise of celibacy for priests. Mm. And, and perfect continence means that one does not engage in any form mm. of, of, of sexual activity. Mm. And that uh, should be clear to everyone. Now, if a person has, has a deep-seated uh, attraction in this way and, and, and is, is unable to to be able to be helped to reorder uh, his life or her life, uh, then it is the only proper thing is for the person to to leave uh, the active priest and ministry or to leave the religious life. Mm -hmm. I want to move on to uh, a question I've been receiving when people heard you were coming on today. That they're asking, what of the dubia? You posed with uh, three other cardinals questions, and these are very deliberate, clear questions of the Pope regarding his Amoris Laetitia uh, apostolic exhortation. You've received no response to that, and, and the, the heart of this really was whether the divorced and remarried without an annulment could receive communion. And the, the, the questions are posed to get clarity on these various issues surrounding this controversy. Have you received any answers, and why not? No, we've, we, we have not received any response. Uh, we, we submitted the dubia. We also uh, asked more than once to be received an audience in order to receive a response to the dubia. There has been no response. Uh, the, a response must be made because these dubia are not, uh, how should we say, capricious questions mm -hmm. or, or peripheral questions of, of some eccentric cardinals. Uh, these are five questions which have to do with the very heart of the church's teaching on marriage and the Eucharist and on the moral law. Mm. And so th these questions, and, and certainly uh, I am determined that they will, uh, that the faithful must have a response to these questions in order to have a secure uh, direction for their lives. Mm. At one point you said if, if there was no response, there would be a reaction. What where do you go from here? What is the reaction? Well, well this is this is a difficult part. Uh, what do you do in such a case? Uh, at the, the the classical uh, institute is called uh, 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 correctio. In other words, uh, ad, a correction uh, of either a failure to teach or uh, a, a correction of a false teaching. Uh, the difficulty is there, there's no clear procedure in the church's uh, discipline uh, uh, about how is this to be carried out. And, uh, and so we, we continue to, uh, to, 
and it's not only now the, the two of us who are still alive of the four cardinals, mm -hmm. our Cardinal Walter Brownmiller and myself. And mm -hmm. of course, we, concern, we continue to be deeply concerned that these questions be answered. Mm -hmm. But there are also others, who, uh, other cardinals who are deeply concerned also. It, mm -hmm. it, the, the question now is to find the, the proper way f for the good of the church to, to have a clear answer to these questions. Mm. And that's about as much as I can say. So a formal correction is on the table, is what you're saying. Yes, it's, oh, it, it will remain on the table as long as the questions are not, are not answered in accord with the church's teaching and discipline. Mm. Uh, I want to move on to a story we reported a little earlier, and I need you to put your canon law hat on, which I know is always within reach, if not in place. Uh, Bishop Frank Caggiano in the, in the <laughs> Diocese of Bridgeport, Connecticut, has appointed a woman to a new leadership position in the parish. She is uh, to serve as a parish life coordinator, and she will have decision-making authority over a team of priests who are responsible for what they're calling sacramental ministry. Uh, your reaction to this, is this canonically valid? Well, I, I haven't seen the, the documentation about this. In fact, this is the first that uh, mm -hmm. I've heard about it. I would have to study it in order to comment on the, mm -hmm. the actual uh, situation in the Diocese of Bridgeport. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the only thing I can say is this, that uh, the, the office of pastor... Uh, which is intimately connected with the administration of the sacraments can only be conferred upon an ordained priest. And so uh, I, I don't know. I would have to s study to see what mm -hmm. the meaning mm -hmm. uh, is of the terminology pastoral life coordinator. Is that mm -hmm. what, what uh, it's yeah, called? Yeah, that's the terminology. I, I would have to study that. <laughs> but the, the pastoral care of a parish must be in the hands of an ordained priest. He's, he, he's been ordained, he's received the grace to act in the person of Christ as a shepherd of the flock, and you, every, all the faithful have the right to demand the care of, uh, of a priest. Mm. Before I let you go, I, I have to get your opinion of a major story. We've really been reporting this all fall and into the, and to the present, really for years. And it is the, the deal struck between the Vatican and Beijing where uh, the government is allowed to choose bishops which the Pope can then veto or ratify. Uh, there was a hope, I think, that this would allow more openness for the Catholics in China to practice their faith. But since this deal was enacted, it seems the Chinese government is more controlling, churches are closing, uh, faithful are being targeted, a bishop has disappeared, priests are being detained. Your thoughts on this deal? My question is, why are we surprised? Mm. We know what the Chao Ping thinks. We, we know how he thinks. He's openly declared that there is no religion in China except China. Mm. China is the religion. And uh, how can we uh, put into hands of people who, are, who, who clearly uh, not only reject the church but have and manifest uh, a positive hatred for the Catholic Church. Mm. How can we put into their hands the the proposal of the of the names of bishops? Mm. And at the same time, how can we uh, recognize uh, the, those who have collaborated with such a government uh, as as legitimate uh, pastors in the church? Mm. Uh, I, to me, it, the the whole matter is unconscionable, and we have. Uh, decades of confessors of the faith and martyrs uh, because of their loyalty to Christ in his one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And that's what has to be defended here. And I, I, I'm sorry, but I, I'm not surprised at all of this uh, absolute uh, disdain for the Catholic church that's being shown by a government with whom we have uh, made an agreement, and it's, it seems clear to me that the agreement is only uh, to, the, to the damage uh, of the Roman Catholic Church. Mm. Cardinal Raymond Burke, as always, thank you for being here. We hope to see you again very soon. And Merry Christmas. Thank you, Raymond. Merry Christmas. God bless you. President Donald Trump signed into law Tuesday the Iraq 
and Syria Genocide Relief and Accountability Act, which, among other things, codifies the U.S. aid to the war-torn country actually reach Christians and Yazidis. Previously, much of the American aid was going solely to Muslims and none of it to Christian aid societies or organizations already on the ground. The president had this to say at the White House signing. We appreciate it. In a few moments, I will sign legislation to assist religious and ethnic groups targeted by ISIS for mass murder and genocide in Syria and Iraq. The bill also authorizes U.S. government efforts to help bring preparations and perpetrators of these heinous crimes to justice and to justice very swiftly. Joining me now is the co-chair of the House Pro-Life Caucus and the author of the newly signed bill providing aid to persecuted Christians in Iraq and Syria that we just mentioned, New Jersey Congressman Chris Smith. Congressman, thank you for being with us. Raymond, thank you very much, and thanks now, for having me on. Now, tell me, why was this bill necessary? I mean, I think people are shocked, as they were about two years ago when we first talked about this, or longer, sure. about why that aid, the U.S. aid, wasn't getting to these Christian minorities and other minorities. Where was the money well, going? You know, well, Raymond, the money went to the Middle East but did not make its way to the Christians or the Yazidis. So I held a series of hearings, 10 of them. I asked, appealed to, and it fell on deaf ears to the Obama administration, asking that they free up this money. 70,000 people made their way into Erbil. Uh, they, were, they were survivors of genocide. Uh, and many of them had lost major numbers of the members of their family, and yet they found themselves uh, neglected, grossly neglected by the United States of America. I traveled there. I met with them. They were bewildered themselves as to why we were not helping. Uh, the, the Knights of Columbus certainly helped, $20 mm -hmm. million dollars plus, as did others. So I, f I finally came to the conclusion I got to do a bill to compel it. Hmm. And, and, and it was a bipartisan bill, I'm happy to say, and it mm -hmm. was just signed two years later. It was held up in the Amazing. Senate for over 18 months. Uh, but finally, you know, at least mm. it's going to happen. And there's still a yeah. lot of great needs uh, that these individuals uh, experience. Food, clothing, shelter, yeah. medicines, uh, mm. you know, reintegration. Many of them want to go back uh, mm. to the Nineveh Plain, for example, but it's got to be safe. Now, Bishop Warda of Erbil, who was, uh, who's been on this <clears> show, <throat> and he was at the signing yesterday, he told yes. us, uh, and has told us over many years, that often the church and faith-based organizations that people turn to for the rebuilding could not get the money directly. How important uh, yeah. is it that this bill instructs that the monies from the United States aid not go through these NGOs or the U.N.? And who will they go to? Uh, they could go right to the archdiocese. Um, ah. You know, obviously they need to apply and, and ask for and make, mm -hmm. you know, the compelling needs known. Uh, they certainly are competent. They have provided in the most efficacious way uh, something on the order of $80 million that was contributed, uh, got it out to the most needy and the most, um, you know, at risk. Uh, so, you know, they have a track record that I think is second to none. Uh, so it's, I think it will be very easy for USAID to help these, as we call them, entities that were bypassed in the past. Uh, mm -hmm. So, it, you know, th there's a lot of hope. Archbishop Werda is a walking saint. Uh, he has done tremendous work. Uh, he, he leads with, with, with nobility and, and Christian love. Uh, and remember, a lot of these people were traumatized. They were either mm. tortured themselves or uh, they saw massive numbers of their family members and friends killed by ISIS. Yeah. Uh, that takes a lot of, of recovery, and they're providing it from a church point of view and a trauma point of view, but they also need all the other necessities. Uh, Congressman Smith, let's talk about ISIS. Uh, they've left <clears throat> Mosul and the Nineveh Plains, where m much of the Christian population was. However, right. there have been reports that Christians are not returning because they feel threatened by the predominantly Shiites who, that are in the area now. Yes. Um, and these are, remember, these Shiites came in to help liberate the area from ISIS. So now the Christians are feeling pressured by these Shiite Muslims. What can we do about this threat? Well, I think the pressure that we need to bring to bear on Baghdad and upon all the levels of government there, uh, that the duty to protect your own citizens starts with the government mm. uh, and, and allowing militias to proliferate, uh, to roam, uh, puts a large number of people at risk. So we don't want a second... Uh, iteration of the genocide that we saw before. Uh, the Nineveh Plain is marginally or arguably more uh, safe uh, than Mosul, which is still not. Uh, many might want to stay right in Erbil, uh, where mm -hmm. they made their way to 
uh, as they fled ISIS. Mm. Uh, but, but again, safety is a paramount issue, but mm. also having the humanitarian and recovery funds uh, to help mm. people get back on their feet. Congressman, this bill supports entities conducting criminal investigations yes. into ISIS perpetrators of <clears throat> genocide. Now, does it, does it help in looking and exploring those groups that are not terrorist organizations but pose a threat to the same minorities in the region? Oh, there's no doubt that anybody who commits war crimes, crimes against humanity, acts of genocide, uh, information about their gross misdeeds need to be captured, chronicled, mm. uh, so that very meaningful prosecutions can take place. I was involved with all three of the ad hoc tribunals, starting with former Yugoslavia, Rwanda. Uh, mm. Matter of fact, David Crane, the chief prosecutor, twice was at my hearings uh, talking about the need to capture this evidence and then prosecute. And then, of course, Rwanda was the other one. Uh, and they all had some serious levels of success. I mean, whoever thought Charles Taylor, uh, the president of Liberia, who slaughtered so many people in Sierra Leone and in Liberia, uh, would get a 50-year jail sentence? Well, it happened because of the special court uh, for Sierra Leone. We need that kind of court. This makes sure that we don't lose the evidence. Because you mm. gotta, if you got to bring an action, you have to have the evidence you know, these are not kangaroo courts. They're real courts. And you've got to be able to make the case yeah. uh, with witnesses and, and data that holds up under scrutiny. Mm. Uh, I want to return to the international scene in a moment, but I've got to get your opinion on what's happening on Capitol Hill and here in Washington. President right. Trump this week, as you know, met with your soon-to-be speaker, Nancy Pelosi, and Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer. And uh, he made it clear that the wall would be built, and he's willing to shut down the government to make it happen. Watch. We need border security, and part of border security is a wall. So I don't mind owning that issue. I'll take it. I'll take it. If we close down the country, I will take it, because we're closing it down for border security, and I think I win that every single time. Congressman, the president uh, has uh, the votes in the House, but not in the Senate. What are your thoughts on this wall, and is a government shutdown a good idea? Well, I think he has a majority in the Senate, but he doesn't have the requisite right. 60, 60 votes, votes, which, mm -hmm. you know, very foolish procedures that, that allow filibusters. But that said, you know, back in 2006, Raymond, everyone that I know that, that cared about border security, including Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, voted for the Secure Fence Act of 2006. Right. It envisioned having a serious fence or border or wall mm -hmm. uh, to mitigate people passing in illegally. Um, where did all of that go? Uh, many people who are now opposing the wall uh, were for it then. Uh, my belief is that if you're gonna spend a million, a billion and a half or so, mm -hmm. why not do it right, get the right amount of money there uh, and take away the incentive, uh, one of the incentives that caused people to say, hey, yeah. the borders are porous, we can just pour in. Uh, mm -hmm. I do think that we ought to be looking at trying to resolve the DACA issue. Uh, and other issues, including mm -hmm. the uh, temporary protective status uh, uh, issue. There are 10 countries where people could be sent back. I'm not for that, uh, including El Salvador, one of the largest. So let's, let's come up with a more global settlement. But again, securing your border is extremely important. And I think the president, yeah. you know, even the Washington Post did an editorial saying, you know, the, uh, reasonable people should be able to perhaps take this deal. And I mm -hmm. hope they do. Do you, think, do you think it's the terminology, because he so popularized that wall and talked about the big, beautiful wall, and that now it's become a political hot potato, and his opponents don't want to give him a victory on it at any cost? Just that wall. They'll do anything else, well, but the wall cannot yeah. be built. That, that's an interesting way of looking at it, and you might be absolutely right. Uh, just because he's pushing it, some people will push back. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, I think securing your border is the most reasonable thing uh, Mexico, you know, has its own ways of trying to secure its, its area from people who would just come in and, and, and walk in. Uh, they don't allow people to stay, as do most countries. Right. Uh, just about every country, is for, as a matter of fact. So it's not unreasonable for the country. You know, internationally, from a human rights point of view, there is a right to emigrate. Not the right to immigrate, mm. uh, but we do provide asylum for those who have a well-founded fear of, of, of persecution. That's where our asylum law is all about. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're an economic migrant, we certainly understand your plight, but there's a procedure yeah. to come here over time, mm. uh, and that's why we have immigration laws. Yeah. Uh, I want to talk about another bill the president signed. This one, uh, in addition to the Iraq and Syria bill that we were talking about earlier, the president extended by five years 
a $30 billion emergency plan for AIDS relief, relief PEPFAR, which you also authored. And since 2003, this has saved an estimated 16 <clears throat> million lives, uh, and global AIDS-related deaths have fallen by half since 2005. Tell me what this means, getting this kind of renewal on this bill and five years out. Well, I think it's, you know, I, I saw almost no coverage. You're giving it some coverage mm -hmm. uh, by anybody. But the PEPFAR program, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, is probably the most transformational health initiative ever. It is George W. Bush's greatest legacy, in my opinion, mm -hmm. as you pointed out. 16-plus million people, mostly Africans, uh, lives have been saved. People are on ARVs, a, a, a way of mitigating the disease's progression. And the whole idea of mother-to-child transmission, there are simple, easily administered drugs that prevent a child, as that child is trans going through the birth canal, from getting HIV. And there's at least 2 million kids who have been born uh, to HIV-positive moms uh, who don't have the disease. So, mm. you know, it's just, and it covers so many other things, tuberculosis, uh, mm. a, a, as, which is an opportunistic uh, disease with this, uh, as well as uh, malaria. Uh, Congressman, you and several other members of Congress, Republicans and Democrats, have recently discussed plans to introduce a piece of legislation aimed at shedding light on China's treatment of its minority Muslim population, with hopes of ultimately tying <coughs> that, that, uh, those human rights to trade. Now, you pointed this problem out to the president before he met with Chairman Xi last month. What was his response? Well, I raised it with his people uh, very strongly. Uh, I know he's been focused uh, on trade policy. I think trade policy has to be intertwined with human rights policy. And unfortunately, back in May of 1994, because I remember it mm. like it was yesterday, Bill Clinton severed the link between most favored nation status for China and fundamental, universally recognized human rights. That's mm -hmm. when they took the measure of the United States and said, all they care about is profits. Right. And we've been playing catch up ball ever since. Fast forward to right now, Xi Jinping is on a tear uh, mm -hmm. to destroy religion of every kind, from Christianity mm -hmm. to Tibetan Buddhists to the Muslim Uyghurs in the Xinjiang region. Right. I've held several hearings on it. So our new bill, Marco Rubio introduced it on the Senate side, me on the House, uh, it's bipartisan. It's an effort to say to the president, you've got global Magnitsky Act, you ought to be fining, holding to account, no visas, no ability to trade here individually. For those, those individuals who are part of this, hold the country to account for this massive arrest and concentration camp mistreatment uh, of Muslims uh, in this region. Rabia oh. Qadir, the great human rights activist, she's had her virtually her entire family and extended family, 80 people in all, cousins, oh right on gosh. through the in-laws, all rounded up and mm. abused. This, this is one of the worst, and they're doing it to all the other religions. Yeah. Uh, Xi Jinping did a, a, a thing, and I'll finish with this, uh, a policy change that said that if you do not support the government in all ways, they're even rewriting the Bible, by the way, right. uh, if you're not supporting the government in all ways, uh, we're going we're gonna to crush you. We're going to destroy you. They have surveillance equipment all over the place. We want our government to stop selling that surveillance Yeah, we're equipment. selling them the equipment. We're I selling mean, and I knew and they're you putting have it in churches to, stop that. to watch. Our bill would do that. It would stop it, and it would, it would get very serious, mm -hmm. and, and because this is a pariah nation now. Uh, well, they're right they, there with North Korea. I, I mean, I've seen the reports, and I know people, missionaries have gone there. They have now the facial recognition at the churches. Exactly. So they're, they're seeing who goes in, and then they're tracking them no matter where they go in that village or, in, or, or all over China. That's right. It's, a, it's, a, it's the most intrusive. I mean, we know years ago, I held the first hearing on it when Google, Microsoft, mm -hmm. Yahoo, and Cisco uh, were lending that capability uh, to the Chinese to surveil on the Internet. Now it's everywhere. The wow. Xinjiang, Xinjiang province is where they've perfected it. Mm -hmm. And they, this big brother police state now is rolling it out. They're putting it in churches. They're putting those that they're allowing to stay up. Many of them have been crushed right. and crosses taken off the top and, and the pastors arrested. Just 100 more Christians were arrested just a few days ago. Right. Uh, this is a crackdown that is right out of Mao Zedong's book uh, mm -hmm. of repression. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. What do you make, I mean, picking up on what you're saying there, what do you make of this Vatican-Beijing agreement that, according to reports, gives the Chinese the ability to choose bishops, Catholic bishops, and they have welcomed members of the Patriotic Association in as right. fully-fledged bishops. And as you've said, bishops have disappeared, churches are being destroyed, Catholics are being targeted. 
What are your thoughts on this agreement? Well, I, I think it's an egregiously flawed agreement. Uh, one of the most major blunders that I have ever seen. I know many people in the underground church. I actually visited with Bishop Shu of Baoding Province in 1994 uh, when he was briefly let out of prison. He spent mm -hmm. maybe up to 44 decades, almost 40 years in prison. Uh, and he had nothing but love and compassion for his persecutor. I was amazed by him. Yeah. Uh, but he's part of the underground church. Mm -hmm. And when you deal, you know, when, uh, right now to say that Beijing gets to pick and the Pope gets to ratify, uh, I think that is, you know, th th this, this undermines, I think, uh, this unbelievably faithful underground church. And there's mm -hmm. underground mm -hmm. Protestants as well. Right. Uh, but the underground Catholics, um, you know, Cardinal Zen, uh, and his criticisms have been, you know, I think right on point. And you, I've watched your shows, yeah. um, uh, Raymond. Uh, you've nailed it as well. So we would call on the Vatican to, to um, move in the other direction because this is, this is an, an invitation for uh, being co-opted by a very atheistic slash repressive regime. Yeah, no, it's an amazing agreement. And I, my heart it breaks because you see these letters coming and I get copied on them. These open letters that priests are writing there, the underground community is writing. They're holding fast, but it seems like the church is moving along with the Chinese regime and they feel abandoned. It's, it's, it's a heartbreaker. It's a heartbreaker. Well, but there have been some, you know, Sartre says Sarando and a few others mm -hmm. that have openly praise you know this government right uh the model if you will uh, I, you know i've never seen a government that is more repressive on such a massive scale from their systematic and pervasive use of forced abortion i mean they're mm -hmm. missing 62 million baby girls at various ages because of sex selection abortion pursuant to their draconian one child per couple, now two child per couple policy. The religious freedom issue went from very bad to unbearable yeah. within a couple of years. Right. Their NGO law is also, you know, no contact with the West mm. or we're coming at you with, with a club. Uh, the secret police has been unleashed. Uh, they've always been there, but they're unleashed now on yeah. the, this wonderful society of Chinese people that are suffering. No, it's, uh, they need our prayers and support, and uh, I know you're giving it to them. Uh, Congressman Smith, thank you so much for being here. You can follow all of Congressman Smith's projects and legislation at chrissmith.house.gov. My next guest is a New York Times bestselling author who's written extensively about Christianity and its history. His latest focuses on one man's unlikely role in the birth of Christianity. Joining me now is attorney, columnist, and author of Jesus is Risen, Paul, and the Early Church. Please welcome back to the program, David Limbaugh. He joins us from Missouri. David, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Raymond. Now, now David, what draws you as an attorney? I have a, an attorney friend in, in New Orleans who also spends his days poring over books of theology and finds himself drawn to it. What is the personal draw here for you? Well, I think I might have mentioned in an earlier interview with you when I discovered after way too many years that the Bible is the Word of God and inspired in every respect mm -hmm. by God, the triune God of the universe. I'm just blown away by that, and I, I feel like uh, I ought to avail myself of that privilege of finding out what He is saying to us in his pages. And so I believe in studying the Bible. I, I believe it is enriching, and I love to study theology to have experts uh, that I trust help me break it down and make mm. sense of it. Now, this book, Jesus is Risen, focuses on the Acts and six of the epistles. Why that frame? Why those works rather than, because I know in your past works, you've covered uh, the, the New Testament, the Old Testament prophecies surrounding Christ. Uh, wh why yeah. this? Because after I, my third book was The True Jesus, and it was about the Gospels. So right. I went through every verse of the Gospels, consolidated them, and did a little commentary as I went. Now I want to complete the New Testament. Uh, and so uh, I started with the book of Acts, which is the history of the early church. And as you know, it canonically, mm -hmm. it follows the Gospels. Right. Uh, and then I wanted to do, uh, since Paul wrote more New Testament books than anyone else, 13, mm -hmm. um, uh, even though he didn't write more words, Luke actually wrote more, right. wrote more words. Um, I wanted to cover as many of his epistles as I could because he's the major theologian. He's the major guy that mm -hmm. sets up the doctrine of the church, uh, the early church, and from whom we draw on 
for our theology today. And so I just started writing in the chronological order that he probably wrote them. These are the missionary epistles, the ones that he wrote on his uh, mm -hmm. three missionary journeys. And it's about as far as I could get. I, I let uh, the space limitation control itself. I didn't force it. Mm -hmm. And it just naturally came out to six books. And oh. I will continue uh, in the next book with the rest of them and, and the uh, other New Testament books. You, you really address here the early church and how it spread uh, so rapidly, really uh, unbelievably. What lessons can we take from the example of that first generation of Christians? Well, these uh, apostles, as they came to be called, were not firm believers at the time Christ died, even after having uh, lived with him in his early ministry, earthly ministry, and watched his miracles and heard his words and lived and, and ate, eaten with him and lived with him intimately uh, until they witnessed his bodily resurrection. And they were transformed from skeptical cowards and sometimes believers to full-blown believers who were dedicating their lives mm -hmm. to the point of sacrificial and martyrdom deaths uh, mm -hmm. to spread the gospel. We should be encouraged and emboldened by their faith and their fearlessness against all kinds of odds and persecution and physical and spiritual suffering. We mm -hmm. look to them uh, and they gave up all kinds of earthly and material benefits uh, for the cause of Christ. And that's uh, the model that we should look at. There's something you say in the book that kind of surprised me. You say here that Paul is your favorite biblical figure. Why? Well, except for Jesus, Well, of that's course. what I would think. And, the, and the I reason, would think the big guy would get top billing, but I said, wow, his favorite yeah, you is know, Paul. No, you know, because I'd already said it so many times, and I guess I was right. tired of repeating myself, and I thought when I, when I read through that once after it was probably, I said, well, maybe that's going to be misleading. No, absolutely mm -hmm. Paul, uh, absolutely Jesus. And, then, and Paul, because uh, maybe it's because I'm a lawyer and I love the way he mm -hmm. systematizes theology and lays out doctrine as well as he does. And he's so passionate. I'm a passionate person. Mm -hmm. I can identify with Paul's passion. He was so passionate as a Jew, such a persecutor of Christians. And when he became a believer after he mm -hmm. encountered Christ on the Damascus Road, he turned that passion toward the Lord. And he started spreading the gospel and could not be stopped. Uh, he would, would tell the truth even in the face of persecution mm -hmm. and trials and defiantly mm -hmm. spread the gospel through all these churches. He founded more churches uh, than anyone in the history of the church. And what, was, what is cool about reading his epistles mm -hmm. is the, the intimate love that he has for these churches that he birthed. It's like he gave birth to them mm -hmm. in a physical sense because he's so, uh, he's, he loves them so much and is so concerned when they fall away from the true gospel. And he exhorts them back through words of correction and encouragement. Uh, it's, it's really, uh, when you read these in close proximity, it is really an encouraging and enlightening experience. Okay, I now want to segue from the good news to the eh, not so great news. <laughs> uh, we'll talk. Yeah. You, you no doubt watched this incredible exchange in the Oval Office earlier this week where we had Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, and the president in this heated debate about border uh, security, uh, the legislative branch versus the, the uh, uh, executive, and uh, making threats at each other, pointing fingers. Is this what we're in for, for the coming year or two of divided government in Washington? Oh, it's going to be worse than that. But what I found incredibly hypocritical and calculated was Trump comes out and is very cordial, very respectful, very mm -hmm. deferential, talking about bipartisanship on uh, the various uh, measures that they've worked on together, mm -hmm. uh, the criminal justice reform bill uh, and others. And then he says, I don't want a government shut down, but I do want border security, which we can't have without a wall. Mm -hmm. Then Nancy Pelosi, as soon as she gets the floor, starts lecturing him about wanting a Trump so shutdown. The She's the one the who brought it up. And then he, he said at least three more times, because I watched this video closely, uh -huh. that he did not want to shut the government down. And then Schumer came on and said the Trump shut down, too. So they planned before they went into that meeting to characterize this as a Trump shutdown. It's not a single uh, party shutdown. It's an impasse that may lead to a shutdown. Yeah. And so uh, they were talking about they didn't want that. Trump was saying he wanted transparency, and they kept saying they want to do this in secret. Mm. See, this was Trump at his best in some respects. Mm. This is what we like, that he comes out fighting, and he's, uh, and he's willing to do that in public. In fact, he's anxious to do it in public. And they look like they want to do it behind closed doors because yeah. they're not honest. They will not 
do a border wall. They claim they want border security. Mm -hmm. They've been promising, the Democrats have been promising for five decades at least, that they would do a wall. I mean, they would do border security, and they, they are open borders flagrantly. They even want to get rid of ICE. So they're fraudulent. And mm. they talk about Trump being dishonest. They're dishonest. Mm. You know, it, was quite, it was quite an exchange. It was really amazing. And when they say shutdown, 75% of the government is already funded. It would be 25%, mostly Homeland Security and a few other uh, smaller agencies. That's what we're talking about. Everything else has already been funded through the, through the year. So uh, it, it's a little disingenuous. They make it sound like, you know, uh, the people are not going to get their Social Security checks or something or libraries are going to close. That's not the case. It's, it's posturing. Yeah. Uh, let's move posturing. on. Posturing. This isn't the, the issue ahead. is the security. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. yeah now, let's talk for yeah. a moment about the Michael Cohen conviction and now the news that uh, the National Enquirer's leadership, which is apparently cooperating with Robert Mueller and his investigation of the president, they claim that there was a coordinated effort, that they operated in concert with the campaign to pay off women making accusations against the president, whom they had the rights to that story. Your thoughts on where this places the president, is he in legal jeopardy here and in danger of impeachment? Well, I think it's all ambiguous legally. Uh, there is a, you know, Department of Justice guidelines which say a sitting president cannot be indicted. Mm -hmm. uh, but high, the uh, qualifications are the, the criteria for impeachment, high crimes and misdemeanors, is, is, uh, has a certain meaning in the common law. But as a practical matter, it's a political animal. And whatever the House, which is now going to be controlled by the Democrats, say it is, it is. And they can vote to impeach him. And it won't be based on whether... Uh, he committed a high crime or a misdemeanor or even a real crime. The question is their political calculation. If they think it'll benefit them politically to mm -hmm. impeach him, knowing they're not going to get a conviction in the Senate, most mm -hmm. likely, uh, will it benefit them toward looking toward 2020? That'll be the sole criteria. Mm -hmm. Whether he uh, is in criminal jeopardy, uh, he's not going to be indicted. Or if he is, it'll be it'll really backfire because they there's been a longstanding Justice Department rule against mm -hmm. it. If they mm -hmm. violate that, that'll backfire. But uh, if they indict him, it'll be out when he's out of office, and that's really not relevant to what yeah. we're talking about anyway. It'll be a terrible tragedy if that happens. But yes, it doesn't look good that the that this corporation uh, and the National Enquirer claim these were uh, payments to pr to uh, help his or to avoid hurting his campaign, campaign position. But I'll tell you, this is yeah, this is so absurd to suggest that these kind of indirect payments are actually campaign finance expenditures. That doesn't comport with common sense. This is what I call a synthetic crime that liberals have been creating the, through the federal government. You can violate a tax law criminally without even knowing you've done anything wrong. Is that mm -hmm. what common sense Americans really want the criminal law to do? And now do they want somebody like this uh, New York district attorney who has now announced she's going to go after, look at Trump and, and go through all of his records and see if she can find a crime. That is a scary totalitarian thing. We usually find a crime, evidence of a crime, and then see uh, if, if the person's good for it as opposed to targeting a person mm -hmm. and then going through all of his records intimately and finding out if they can pin a crime on him. People ought to be horrified with that prospect. Yeah, no, it's amazing. This is going to be investigations from wall to wall, David, and no doubt we're going to see the Southern District of New York as well as Mueller, uh, you know, sending out more of these uh, uh, indictments and certainly getting people to cooperate with their, their ongoing probes. Well, a Merry Christmas to you. David Limbaugh, the book is Jesus is Risen, Paul and the early church. It's available now in bookstores everywhere and online. Thanks for being with us, David. Thanks so much, Raymond. It's a pleasure. That is all the time we have for now. Until next week, the show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Like me on Facebook. You can follow me on Twitter. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. Don't forget Will Wilder, The Relic of Perilous Falls, and the second book, The Lost Staff of Wonders. Make wonderful Christmas gifts, and then your readers and adventurers will be all set for Will's continuing adventure in book three. That's coming brand new in February. They are available, all of them, at the EWTN Religious Catalog and at bookstores everywhere and online. And remember my Christmas time in New Orleans special on your local PBS affiliate. Check those listings and airtimes. They're also on my Twitter and Facebook feeds. Be sure to join us next week. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. I don't.